When I was in college at University of Cincinnati, I was in the College Conservatory of Music, thinking that someday I'd become a Hazanit, a cantoress. Thinking that after I would finish the musical education that I got, I'd become a rabbi. <laughs> and I decided to go to a college that was near a rabbinical school, UC. And I, HUC in Cincinnati was right across the street from UC, University of Cincinnati. And I started hanging out there and singing in the choir and enjoying the musical experience. And the musical experience was quite beautiful and quite musical, it was a brilliant director. And he would bring all sorts of musicians from the College Conservatory of Music. It didn't matter if they were Jewish or not, but they were playing Jewish tunes and we were singing Jewish melodies. And it was beautiful musically. And simultaneously at that time, my family, I think they were proud of this idea. My daughter the rabbi, my sister the rabbi. And at that time I visited, my sister was living in Cleveland at the time. And she invited me to go to a bookstore called Paul's. Remember Paul's? I went to Paul's. And because I was brought up in a Reform Jewish background, I always loved Sunday school. I asked a lot of questions. And they didn't have the answers that I was looking for. And I kept delving further. And I said to this guy, Paul, I want a book that tells the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I don't want any watered down Judaism. And he gave me the first volume of what's called Behant Loes, the Torah elegy in English. And I read this volume voraciously. Actually, it's voracious, which is Genesis. I read voracious voraciously, and it, it was this thick, it still is. I got it on my shelf. And it was encompassing only the first 12 chapters of Genesis. And I read this twice. I took it on a trip. We went on a vacation with the family. And I couldn't believe how deep Judaism is in the first 12 chapters of Genesis. I said, if Judaism is this deep, with the first 12 chapters of Genesis, so this is the book of Genesis, and this is the book of Exodus, and the book of Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This is just the five books of Moses. There are over two dozen books of the Bible. Oh my gosh, I gotta learn some more. And I became a junkie for Torah. And I couldn't get enough of it. And then, the feeling kind of waned because I had no one to help pump it in me. I didn't know anybody who knew more of this stuff. And I kept going to HUC and singing in the choir until one day, the choral experience became kind of dull. Especially when we were supposed to be inspiring the audience, we were singing liturgy, prayers, trying to inspire service of God. And one day, the congregants stood up and clapped. I said, why is this different from any other performance? Why is this different than what we do at the College Conservatory of Music? This is not service of God. This is entertainment. And it turned me off a little bit. But I kept singing in the choir because I wanted to become a rabbi. And one day, I was minding my own business, I was on campus, and I saw this guy with a beard and these strings hanging out of his pocket. I thought, maybe he's a championship yo-yo player or something. <laughs> and he was wearing glasses. I found out that you don't have to have the glasses, but it does help to make it look more intellectual. And I went over to him. I was probably one of those anomalies on campus. You know, usually Jewish kids avoid the guy with the beard. And I went over to him, I said, are you Jewish? <laughs> and he says, yes I am. And I said, that book that's on your table, that's standing up on your table, I read that book, I want more, I need that book. I said, where's the next volume? He says, it's not out yet. This was a long time ago. That Torah is this big on my shelf now. And that's only the five books of Moses. And he said, Pull up a seat and we'll talk. 
And kids who are in school still plug your ears. I skipped all my classes that day. I sat and asked and asked and asked. And he was the first person in my life, after being confirmed as a Jew in my temple, he was the first person in my life to answer my questions with substance, with meaning, where I knew that there was no baloney, like the phony baloney that Rob talked about. And I said, this is it. And at the end of that conversation, I helped him bring his books back to his trunk. He put them back in the car, and he invited me for Shabbos, and he gave me their phone number and their address. And since I've been brought up in a very proper home, I knew that I was supposed to dress up. I didn't like to do it, but you know, you gotta do some things that you don't always like, and that's, thank God, the discipline of the Torah. We don't always know why we do certain things, but we do what is right. So my mother always taught me to not just dress up, but you bring a gift. So I brought a decanter of wine. Did I know it needed to be kosher? <laughs> All right, so I brought a not kosher bottle of wine. I didn't know better, but it was a pretty decanter. And I brought it to this house, and it, they didn't serve it at the table. I knocked on the door. I was wearing the nicest pantsuit that I had. In those days, pantsuits were groovy. <laughs> now I heard that groovy became cool, which today is now hip. The old hip is now, I don't know what it's going to become. But I wore these pantsuit. I knocked on the door. A little three-year-old answered the door. She looked me down and up and up and down, and she saw that I had a girl's face and I was wearing pants. <laughs> and she probably thought, like, what is it? And she said to me, how you a girl? <laughs> and I said, yes. And she said, why are you wearing pants? <laughs> and I said, because I don't have a dress. Well, she thought I was deprived and, and you know, I come from my family's Okay, off. Thank God my father's a plastic surgeon, you know. So it's not like I couldn't buy a dress, but I didn't. She was so traumatized. Now, if I had been a social worker then, I might have been able to help her. <laughs> but she went and cried and ran to her mother and clung to her skirt and said, Ema, Mommy, this girl doesn't have a dress. And the woman came to the door and she welcomed me in and no one looked at my pants again and no one was bothered by them. And they made me feel that their home was my home. And they invited me to have the Shabbos meal with them. And it was wonderful. And now, not only do I have this rabbi, but I've got this intelligent woman too. So I picked her brain and the whole night we talked and talked and talked until I was ready to go and they said, wait, you're not staying? I said, stay? What do you mean? Well, we don't drive on Shabbos. I said, but we do. <laughs> and they didn't push, they didn't prod. I said, if I had known that this is what you do, I would have come with a suitcase and clothes. I didn't know. But tomorrow morning I have a solo in the choir at HUC, so I've got to be there. I'll disappoint Bud Yashur, he, he would be very disappointed if I didn't show up. So I went, they didn't hold me. But the following time that I went, I came with a suitcase, with a change of clothes, with what I needed. And little by little, I had wonderful, greater and greater experiences with these people and the people in the community there. 